Amitofo. Good to see everyone here. Um, this uh, class is going to be one that's going to take us back to the roots of Chan. Uh, it's a class that um, I think will be helpful in many respects. I do have a, a working template of what I'm doing. Um, one might say a PowerPoint. Uh, I don't know. If, can we get that up? Uh, so then you'll see where we're heading with this. It's kind of a reverse design PowerPoint. Rather than me taking something from other places, I put it all together. So, okay, so we have that. And um, okay. Um, in this uh, particular topic, uh oh, we got it cut off somehow. There we go. Okay, good. Um, it. I wanted to show where this school of Chan came from, and we're only going to talk about the Buddhism as it applies to the Chan school in this particular lecture. So, uh, I wanted to show the flavor of of Buddhism that came through and where it came from so that you have a better understanding of what was happening. Now, I mentioned in the past that um, that Chinese Buddhism was a bit of an echo from what had been happening centuries before um, in India. So by the time uh, the Chinese received uh, the scriptures um, and treatises from India, um, several hundred years had passed in some cases. And so they were getting um, this information from China. And it was very, very unique because, excuse me, not from China, from India, but it was unique because when the um, information came in, there wasn't a, um, a, a distinguishing between this type of Buddhism and that type of Buddhism. Uh, they weren't getting, let's say, at the same time, the critiques of a particular school or doctrine versus another. It just came rolling in all these different scrolls. And these scrolls, then they reviewed them and saw, wow, this is really good. But they didn't discriminate and say, this one belongs to this school, this one belongs to that school. Rather, what they did was that they they just really consumed it. They were so excited to receive this information and it also balanced very well with the indigenous uh, doctrines of Confucianism uh, and Taoism so these all came together and that's what made it very interesting to the Chinese in addition to the fact that it had a certain general salvation um, component to it that enabled all um all people to to be delivered and so this was something that resonated very very strongly in in china at that time um but as it was coming in there was just certain scrolls that came in initially and then later on there was more and we'll go into kind of the um the stages of the how the buddha had had taught um in, during his lifetime. And it's interesting because uh, as anyone practices Buddhism and, and you start working with Chan, you start realizing that you start with a per, like a basic level and, and then you move on to something else and then you move on to another one. And each one enhances what you'd learned before, but it enhances it in such a way that as you begin learning, you realize you're at the bottom of a V like this, and that you know so very little. That's when you really are beginning to practice uh, Buddha Dharma is when you realize how little you know. And so you, you have an interest that you want to, to study, but where do you study? How do you study? How can you do things if in, in this way? It is not very easy for us to, to understand that. When we first start out and 
are reading um, basic books, sometimes from Master Shen Ying, just to get us there. The Heart Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, and we may hear a lecture here and there on the Shurangama Sutra or the Lotus Sutra, different sutras that may come into play. And we try to make um, some kind of sense out of, out of all of this. And what I want to do with this class, and I'm not sure how many classes it'll take, maybe, maybe one, maybe more, to go through and give you an idea of what is um, entailed in Chinese Chan Buddhism. I, I really like Chinese Chan Buddhism. Uh, and the reason that I like it is because it takes from, from other schools and puts it in a way in which one can fulfill it through their practice, like Samantha Bhadra, uh, uh, Pushan Pusa, where it is fulfilled by our actions. And so this is good, but there is a solid foundation behind it. Sometimes when we look at it and we see that there is this, um, uh, that there's not a Chan foundation there, there's no Chan school doctrine except for the treatises of the Chan masters, but there's no particular uh, Chan that came through uh, from India. It is just something peculiar um, to the, uh, to Buddha Dharma, based on the fact that the um, uh, that it was flavored by by uh, the Chinese indigenous uh, uh, doctrines and schools that were there, and, but it came out in a very effective way, uh, not only in 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 uh, practice but also in doctrine. And these schools themselves from, and you see on the screen, Abhidharma, Madhyamika, Yogacara, these schools are discrete schools. And they've been battling with each other for quite a while in terms of debating particular parts of them. Uh, I don't know how deep I can go into the distinctions between them, but by and large, they're still Buddha Dharma. And they have different ways of, of looking at things and historically how they related to each other and, and historically how they related because of, of um, the discriminations of one group to the other um, and some believing that one went beyond what the Buddha taught, which is kind of the, the Theravadan view. And if you look over to the left, that's the Abhidharma, uh, the Theravadan Abhidharma. Uh, and we'll get to that in a moment. I'm just kind of giving you an overview of where we're going with this, because this is this is a, an important one. This is not a complete list. It's not a complete way of of looking at anything or studying the theories of these schools. Each of these schools take years to master years. So I'm not attempting to try to do that in this this uh, short time that I have to talk to you about it. But what I want to do is I want to show you what is uh, what these schools are about and then to show you how they poured into, into the Chan school. So you begin to get an idea of, of what you're practicing. When we do a Chan um, lecture, you know, we have to pay homage to uh, what was taught before and know the source of what was being taught. Um, and there's so much blending of different kinds of, of schools and studies based on orientations. Sometimes um, uh, there are schools that were developed simply because whoever had the information may not have had some of the other other sutras to compare to it, but they look at it and they see it in, in a way in which uh, uh, it will um, it will work. I think one of my dogs is, are scratching at the door. I must, mustn't have let him in. So if he keeps doing it, I'll have to interrupt. I'm sorry. Um, the What we have uh, is in the roots of Chan, what was seen originally um, as it was developing in India was a devotional study. 
Um, and this devotional study was just giving respect to the Buddha. And there was this transitioning in terms of what, what the, the Buddha entailed or what the Buddha was. And initially there was the, the Theravadan school and Theravadan means the study of the elders. And so they looked at it and compiled uh, what they believed to be the, uh, the entirety of what the Buddha taught. And you'll see a book like that if you go to a, Bo a Buddhist bookstore, some bookstore, and, and you'll see there's a book saying what the Buddha taught. And, and what they did was they, they're limiting it to a particular amount and essentially um, do not give any credence to the Mahayana Sutras. Um, and, and so it, they stop at, at one point so that they um, that they see it as something that that's um, the the point where all of what the the Buddha taught everything else was just made up or, or what they call um, it does not have Buddha Vakana. The term Buddha Vakana means that you can directly trace it back to the to the Buddha, but there was no tape recorder back 2500 years ago there was no no transcriber 2500 years ago this was all uh prepared word of mouth for quite a while so it's very difficult to say exactly what the buddha taught although efforts were made to try to protect the integrity of the teachings we cannot say that even theravadan uh, teachings um directly quoted the buddha in a precise way um, all of this is what is the understanding of people such as elders who understood and and, and then began to to make it into a full system um, there. Uh, and there was um, coming through the the have to read my notes are kind of a little bit difficult but but through the the Tian Tai school um it was uh determined that that how the buddha taught in 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 particular periods of time and they broke it down into that he he started with with a vatamsaka sutra uh, information but it was very very deep and so switched over to the Agamas, uh, which is which is primarily what was studied by the Theravadins, and then went into what was called the Vyapula uh, Sutras. These sutras are sutras that are defined as containing the very essence of Buddha Dharma and are not lacking any aspect of Buddha Dharma in their teachings. Those uh, those Vyapula Sutras are by and large their their Mahayana Sutras. Um, but there, those sutras um, contain pretty much everything there. From there, then there was uh, considered to be the Prajna Paramita Sutras. Again, this is a definition from the Tian Tai school. But to, just to kind of give you an idea of how one school looks at things and how they progress, then to the Lotus and Nirvana Sutra. And the Lotus Sutra was one that is placed as as one of the last ones as being there um and it is concentrated uh, that's the school that tian tai looks at and sees that uh that is the preeminent the highest level of presentation now if you go further down you'll find out that you'll see uh tathagata garbas uh sutras uh that are that come afterwards and then when we're looking at the tathagata garba sutras we will get into sutras such as the lion's roar uh sutra queen Trimala Devi's lion's roar sutra um the uh Vilamakriti sutra um the ratna gotra bhaga sutra uh these sutras are all referring to buddha nature and they you also We'll get into the uh, Dharma Dharmada Vibhaga Sutra, uh, uh, Maitreya or Milafo's uh, uh, expositions to uh, uh, to a Sangha, um, and uh, and so 
these all are very, very deep and advanced even beyond what, what the Tiantai and the Lotus uh, Sutra is, is there. And when we look at the Huayen school, uh, just a little bit below the, the top on the left-hand side, Huayen is, um, is from the Huayen Jing um, or Flower Adornment Sutra, uh, sometimes called the Avatamsaka Sutra, or say, I should say originally called the Avatamsaka Sutra. And this particular um, um, uh, study was one the Huayen came from that um, and used it as its base of operations in terms of how, how it studied. And what's interesting um, here, we, um, we don't have uh, some of the information that I put down and I have to thank uh, Michael Snobel for, for doing this literally in, in one hour. I, I mean, uh, he was given something like this to, to to try to to look at and say you know type this and and he did it you know um he missed a few things but that's okay this is still a work in progress but what i wanted to do is is uh sh show you something so that you can have a base of reference as to where this is coming from so when we look at at the yn school the yn school uh, uh incorporated uh, Madhyamika, and we'll go back up in a moment to the Madhyamika, and, and you'll see how we're kind of flowing through this um, rather than trying to give you give you it like in some kind of a uh, collegiate way. I want to give you a flavor and a feeling for it, how it flows from one to another, and so what's happening. So when we look at it, Yen brings in uh, the Mad Madhyamika school, sometimes they'll call it Madhyamaka, um, and the uh, the Yogacara school is also coming in, if we can kind of go back a little bit closer to the top, we incorporate that part. Thank you. Okay, so we have Huayen down there, and you, you're seeing Madhyamika's coming into Huayen, Yogacara's coming into to, to Huayen, and then if you go up just a little bit further, Thank you. And then you see uh, Awakening the Faith of Mahayana. This was a major, major treatise. I mean, it was so pivotal in terms of bringing forth many different doctrines um, and, and of Mahayana doctrines and, and really the highlighting of bodhisattvas and changing them from a devotional aspect to one in which it incorporated all all sentient beings within that and and so it was just in the in the opening baby steps in terms of doing it but it was definitely an incredible change um where it was one where it it was such that people would look at it and say you you mean that there's this buddha nature and so it's it's very, very powerful at that time. And now when it says awakening um, um, of the faith in Mahayana, Mahayana here does not mean the school of Mahayana. It means the Buddha, the, the Buddha vehicle, the highest vehicle. So Mahayana, when we, when we, now we look at it and say, well, as compared to Hinayana, or Theravadan, that this was the highest vehicle, but actually back then when it was being used, it was being used in a way that it was simply um, referring to the Buddha or the Buddha mind. And so that is a very important distinction and, and understanding that we have to see that from where this term Mahayana came from and where this school at this point there was no mahayana school it was just set, setting forth the doctrine of the buddha mind so it was incredibly powerful at that point it was not something contrary to, to theravadan a little bit later on then when uh, when we we get into the establishment let's say over on the left with abhidharma 
And the Abhidharma school is opening up and saying that everything is real. And, and again, these schools are very, very complex and I'm oversimplifying them um, just simply for the sake of time. Uh, they're, they're very detailed in terms of, of how you understand um, the, the Abhidharma and seeing things that are, are real. Let me go for a second, let me see where. And actually, this is from uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy uh, on Huayan Buddhism. And the Stanford uh, Encyclopedia of Philosophy sometimes has some really great articles. And it, and it, it gives you ability to jump from there to other, other parts. So I like it a lot. It's, it's a, let's say, uh, it's like Wikipedia, but just for much more intellectuals. Um, and uh, so it gives you a, a kind of a, a, a good background. And this particular one was on Hawaiian Buddhism, but it actually was on Buddhism itself. Um, but in this one, they were talking about the three influential schools, Abhidharma, um, which is Theravadan, Madhyamika, which is Mahayana, and Yogacara, which is Mahayana. Um, and when we look at that, we probably should also include uh, Vajrayana that came later, which is like the younger brother of the Chan school, and that was more Tibetan influence. Um, they were uh, more centered um, on the Tathagata Garbha Sutras. Um, uh, they have a very powerful understanding, deep, profound uh, uh, school uh, as well. And, but we're only, concentrating today on on the Chinese Chan school. So here it's talking about that that each of the school interprets key concepts of Buddhism in different ways. And it says Abhidharma Buddhists argue that things that are taken to be independent, persistent selves by common sense as such as a particular monk um, and the objects like like chariots exist only in convention meaning that they exist because they're appearing. So if they're appearing, they're real. And, um, and then they said, however, these conventionally existing entities are ontologically, that means like how they come into being, um, grounded in other genuinely existing dharmas, uh, meaning that they're all connected in accordance with the dependent origination. Um, so they so they're they're following that part but but say that everything is is real and um entities such as instantaneous configurations of matter or temporary mental states although these dharmas are transient and causally dependent on one another they also possess self nature or uh swabhava and this is where they got into a fight with splinter groups later on that would become known as Mahayanas because the Mahayanas would look at it, scratch their head and say, well, I'm not sure if that's the way it is, you know, um, that, that everything is real in this way. And they start looking at it. And there here is where the argument begins to come up as opposed to whether something is nihilistic, meaning it doesn't exist at all, which obviously is not the Theravadan way, or something is eternalistic, which means that it always exists and is always there. And this is where then the Madhyamika school and the Yogacharans pick the bone, and I'm not going into the, the early prototypes of those uh, of those schools that were making these arguments well before, before they were known as Madhyamika and, and Yogacara. But there was this positing of looking at things and saying, that falls into eternalism, everything is real. Instead, we think that 
everything is empty, such as the, the uh, Madhyamika school would say, everything is empty, there's, there's nothing there. But the problem with saying that everything is empty is there's a danger that it could fall into a nihilistic uh, interpretation. Nihilism means that there's nothing there. That's a very big danger. But Nagarjuna, uh, which was a proponent of the Madhyamika school, was, um, was a very astute philosopher. And he understood that that would be a problem. And certainly people would begin to attack attack them on that basis, and they did. But what he did was develop the two truths uh, doctrine. And in the two truths doctrine, there is what is the uh, uh, apparent reality or apparent truth and the absolute truth. And so you, you would have to scratch your head and say, how is this? How can there be an apparent reality and an absolute reality? Um, how, how do you do that? So, so this is where um, Nagarjuna took the advice of Villamakriti from the Villamakriti Sutra and, um, and responded by not saying anything. So in the Villa Makriti Sutra, when they're talking about the idea of emptiness, um, Manjusri was the last of several uh, bodhisattvas that were, uh, were expounding on emptiness. And he said, well, you, you really uh, can't talk about it with words. If you talk about it with words, all the, all the meaning is lost. It, it cannot be this way because it's not conventional. It's unconditioned. And so then he asked Villa McCritty, what do you think about this? And this is uh, from the Villa McCritty Sutra, uh, the, the second of most famous use of not, of not uh, speaking. Um, and he didn't say a thing. The first time in the Villa McCritty Sutra that someone didn't speak was Sariputra, earlier on in the sutra when he was uh when a goddess asked him a question and he just didn't know how to answer it and so he remained silent but the goddess went you're silent because you don't know and um and so so that's one of the instances in where he got picked on um because sariputra was representing abhidharma representing the theravadan school but they juxtapose that kind of an ignorant silence to Villamakriti's all-knowing silence. And it is what inspired Nagarjuna to develop these two troops. Now, it's very interesting because in these two troops of Nagarjuna, there's other schools that have developed three troops or more troops to do that, but they are are uh, such as the Tian Tai school uh, and and Fazang um, developed the three truths, but they're by and large just uh, expounding on the two truth doctrine. In any case, though, um, this idea of that there is this ap apparent reality because we cannot we cannot just simply say that's real or unreal. Because if we say it's unreal, then it falls outside of any kind of a description or any kind of thing falling into nihilistic. Uh, and, and that would, would mess up the whole idea of, of Buddha mind, because there would be something outside of Buddha mind. But the notion that this apparent reality is impermanent does not negate it from being included in the absolute. In fact, that is its ability to merge with the absolute reality, which is uh, if we use the Yogacara school, then um, and all the way down to Tiantai and, uh, and Huayan school, that is the noumenon. Um, and um, 
the apparent reality is the phenomena. Sometimes it's referred to as you could say as the denominator in a fraction where you have something that appears to exist, but it is only a fraction of the denominator and the denominator is the Buddha mind. So when we see things in this way, then we understand that they're not, they're not separate. It is just that that phenomena that's appearing is part of, of that and, and what makes up the denominator. So it's very interesting because when this was happening, and the Tian Tai school is looking at this. And so, so uh, um, in, in that way, when we look at things, we, we see um, that it, that kind of an idea pours down in, into, the, into the other um, schools and, in, in how it how it works, going back up. So then we back up to the Madhyamika school and the two truths. And then we we understand that there's no difference between them. But as soon as we open our mouths to try to define them with words, we're lost because it is something that is a very important aspect of our practice. And that is the the esoteric, um, the esoteric you could call a, like a secret teaching. It's not secret though. It's just that we just cannot uh, access that channel. But is what Nagarjuna was presenting there is you could say a sort of a secret channel or esoteric channel of understanding, requiring you to put down conventional thinking and reason and just looking directly into mind. This is difficult and it certainly is difficult for a philosopher. You're a philosopher, you're a, a scholar. How do you write that down? How do you write that down? How do you even come to that? Most scholars never come to that kind of a realization and they just, just chew on words and, and they mess everything up. And they're able to categorize it this way and that way and talk about things and but they really do not get to the essence the realization of what's there so they can only talk with words and all of these fancy words and uh, but it doesn't help uh, recently uh, one of my students posted something from some philosophers um, uh, and they they were talking about uh, the nature of mind and, and when you and you and you and you do that. And, and they, they all missed it because when they did that, they essentially missed that the idea there is no you there to do that. And that's what the Madhyamika school was presenting at that time was that there is no you. And when you see things in, in, from a different perspective, it requires you to give attention to contemplating that. And, it, and it's going to um, that point of turning the mind's eye inward so that one can perceive from the Buddha mind. And that's what that school was doing. If we can go back to the, the page, please. Um, and uh, so, okay. So when we're, we're back to that, then essentially um, we talked about Abhidharma and everything is real. Um, it was the, the, the Theravadan school was very chauvinistic. It still was uh, male oriented. Um, and uh, the, there was an emphasis on the monks. Um, and when, when it, went to the faith in Mahayana, there was a tremendous turning there. And you can see as highlighted from various sutras, and especially in the Tathagata Garbha Sutras, there was an attention on, for instance, Villa Makriti, who was a lay person, schooling the, um, the Buddhist um, monks. And um, 
there were uh, there was um, several goddesses at school Sariputra. Uh, uh, one was Lonyu, which was the daughter of the of the um, dragon king, and and Sariputra was questioning her as as to whether or not she could. You know, how could she study? And she's a woman after all, and she couldn't do that. And she just at that time says, well, I can become enlightened just in this moment. And boom, she became enlightened. And um, and so there was this idea of this all inclusiveness that came there that where before the study of the elders was very restrictive in how it was looking. And that if you did certain things, you could not, um, you could not get out of it. And, and if you, so that there was no possibility for you to, to, uh, to go further or to become enlightened due to some actions is the most heinous would be to kill a Buddha. Uh, but in, in the way of the Mahayana, it was all inclusive and it was pointing to that just this mind is the the buddha nature just this mind is buddha and it was a tremendous turnaround instead of looking at things from from one perceiving uh the buddha here to this joining and and direct gnosis or direct connection with the Buddha. And that was the practice. Our practice is just using the Buddha mind in the right way. That is why um, Master Ling Chi said, after he told uh, the audience that they all have the Buddha nature, he says, now that you have it, just use it when you need it. And when you don't need it, don't use it. So what he was talking about was letting go of any kinds of discriminating thoughts. Not, not that there are uh, to the point that you don't have thought. And that would be um, a, something that would not be of any use. So all of this of what Master Ling Chi was saying was all trickling through from this of uh, the, the idea of, of Ekayana or just this one mind, and and this was was echoed in these uh, these sutras and the Buddha Nature Treatise, which was uh, relied very heavily uh, in the Madhyamika school. Um, in terms of of Yogacara, it spawned its own Chinese doctrine, and I probably didn't spell it right, or maybe it is uh, um, right. Uh, Cheng Wei Shulin. Um, of the doctrine of mere consciousness. And so in the Yogacara school, there was the, the idea of um, that, um, that everything is just a manifestation of mind. Excuse me, I just have to make sure I have a okay. um, and, uh, and so they were looking at it and seeing things in terms of how this was consciousness only. So everything was just consciousness as opposed to reality. But in looking at this, then they, in order to make this work, they developed uh, what is uh, called uh, the Alaya Vishnana to put on top of, of the seven consciousness that, that were there. And these consciousness were the sense organs, and then this one that gathers everything together. And then the seventh consciousness, then uh, interacting with the eighth consciousness um, by use of what they call bija seeds, B-I-J-A, it, it formulates an opinion or a direction or a stream of thought based on what it's perceiving should happen next ba based on all these appearances that are happening all of these things are happening in the mind and they're interacting with what's called the storehouse consciousness which is the alaya vishnana and so 
So it in this way, without that, then it would have been difficult for them to say it's just mere consciousness, because if they said it's mere consciousness, then there's two problems with that. <laughs> the first problem would be that it would fall towards the nihilistic side where, where there would not be um, anything there. It's because it's just a wisp of smoke. It's just consciousness and gone. There's nothing there. Um, and so the, the difficulty is, is that they need something to interact with it, which is the eighth consciousness. And so, so in order to look at that, then we have to say this eighth consciousness is, it is mind only. But the thing is, is that when we look at it, it, it doesn't uh, come so clearly as to the, uh, to that there is a, an intrinsic nature of mind. Um, it doesn't define that as well. So a lot of these, schools are kind of hedging their bets because they they don't want to be argued that they fall into nihilistic or that they fall into eternalistic which is maybe um the biggest slam could be especially on on the tathagata garba sutras would be that it's monistic that there's actually this buddha god there but there is no buddha god there isn't anything like that but to us when we hear that that's a bit of a shock because we often equate the Buddha with a, a deity or a God or something above the God. Um, but it isn't in this way. It's difficult for us to break through and to see that it's just this mind and the nature of mind. But we, we don't understand that because um, it's difficult for us to to understand that it, it's like analogous to in the old testament where uh god appeared like a burning bush and and i'm sure that that probably didn't sell very well because of the fact like they'd say what's a burning bush and and they're they could not relate to that and and so so it's kind of scary because when we talk about emptiness, then the the difficulty with emptiness is that people begin to take the idea that it's nihilistic, that there's nothing there. But what I've been trying to rectify it by saying that it's an all-inclusive emptiness it's empty by nature of inclusion if everything is mine then then in in that way we don't even have to call it mine but that's difficult for us to understand because that again is the esoteric aspect of the practice of a direct realization this is where this leads to to the chan school and the practice of meditation, but we have to practice with the right view. If we don't practice with the right view, then what happens is, is that we end up um, losing our perspective in terms of, of uh, what we're practicing and why we're sitting on a cushion and we're just sitting there and, and so many go to a retreat and they sit there thinking that if they cross their legs and blank their minds, then they will get a realization. That's not how it works. It really isn't. And in the last retreat that uh, um, I gave, I stressed that greatly that this is not the way to do that. One has to maintain a, a, this innate awareness that we have and directly look at what is arising, not to the exclusion of anything. And it is this, which is the turning of the mind's eye inward and this idea of perceiving. That is where um, eventually we got to in the Prajnaparamitas, where one is using the mind's own perception to see things. That this is what Chan embraced, this great uh, doctrine and seeing that this deep Prajnaparamita, this deep wisdom that, that cleared up the direction of how that we 
we look at things. And when we, we do it in that, that way, mind distance itself from the idea that there is a life of being or a personality or an ego that's there. And this is something that, let me put it real quick. If we were going to look at the method properly, we would see that there's an I, this is an I here, and the method is here. This particular part of mind is the Dharmakaya. Uh oh. All right. <laughs> Somehow we change. Anyway, this particular part of, of, of the mind is the Dharmakaya where things appear on. This particular aspect of mind is is the the aspect of mind which is the knowing aspect of mind this is what the guan ching pu sa used to perceive that all five skanda are empty because it looked at it and all it saw all of these things that were here but what it saw was that they're all projected on the surface of the mind so it's like two mirrors looking at each other and when we see that, it is able to penetrate through the appearances that are there. Now, when we meditate, we believe that we are, hold on, <laughs> looking, we are on, on this side looking here. We mess that up. We really mess that up because what we're doing is we're using our consciousness to meditate. We have not yet turned our mind's eye inward, but we believe we have. And as a result of that, we think that we are sorry, this side here. But in fact, what's happening is we are actually only seeing this and we have tripped we have tricked ourselves into thinking, hold on, sorry. We have tricked ourselves into thinking that this person that's sitting meditating is the mind. It's not. And we have to be able to move towards this side so that when this side is seeing, it sees what appears to be us meditating it is arising in the mind so when something is arising in the mind it's clear that this person this life and being that was perceived to be meditating all of those those thoughts and emotions and experiences all of those belong to this side their appearances and the mind is here and it it is seeing all of that so this was an important development in in the um, in the schools, and when when that happened, this is what we call ekayana. And ekayana is just one mind, um, and we see clearly. So all of these uh, items that had been coming through, uh, all of that is is pouring in. And beginning to make sense to the to the Chan uh, practitioners. If we could have this the my PowerPoint up again. So um, thank you. So so what we're seeing is, and we just scroll up for a sec. And okay, and so we're seeing awakening the faith in Mahayana, which is concentrating on Buddha nature, and. Uh, um, and it strongly introduced the theory of Tathagatha Garbha and the idea that there is uh, this Buddha womb. Uh, there's two ways of interpreting the Buddha womb. One of them is that the Buddha womb is something that is um, a um, the 
the potentiality of becoming a Buddha. And the, the other is, is that the womb itself is where everything is created. I subscribe to, to the latter of those where, where when we're looking at it, the Buddha womb is in the Dharmakaya. Everything that arises has to appear somewhere so it's here. But what's important to know, it's really important to know, is that all of that is created by the mind. It's not created by that little fellow sitting there meditating. He's a phantasm, a dream. And that was what was so important in terms of all of these teachings. And you go back to all of these, whether it's from the Vatamsaka Sutra or the Lotus Sutra, uh, whatever sutra, you see that the, there, there is a total uh, uh, clarity that such lives and beings are non-existent. It is just simply mind. And that's when it got to chant from all of these schools pouring in, it came through clearly that, that Chan was, was looking at this and picking out the parts that made sense rather than discriminating, at least at that time. Because at that point in time, taking the sutras, maybe the, the Chinese were a bit um, uh, novices in, in the study of Buddha Dharma. But they looked at things and go, that makes sense to me. This makes sense to me. This makes sense to me. And so they created this incredible flavor of Buddha Dharma that took these schools, which could appear to be in total contradiction to each other and incorporated the best of what they had. This is a, such an incredible flavor of Buddha Dharma, very unique to the Chinese bringing in this kind of an understanding of, of, um, of Buddha Dharma and going, we can use this and we can use that and we can use that. All of these things make sense. And instead of trying to criticize them, those kinds of views would come later, but they were not what the, um, what was the emphasis in, in the Chinese uh, Buddhist philosophy, the, the emphasis was one on this all inclusion by looking directly at the, the Buddha nature, the Buddha mind. And in this way, when we see things and we see that there is this Buddha nature, everything begins to fit. And that's why all of these, whether we're talking about the Vatamsaka Sutra, the Lotus Sutra, the uh, no, Shurangama Sutra, Diamond Sutra, all of the Prajnaparamita Sutras, all of them all fit together when we begin to see this and we begin to see how, how they fit. And this idea of uh, the Tathagata Garbha Sutras as early as awakening the faith of Mahayana, really setting forth thusness, setting forth Buddha nature, uh, setting forth this idea of conceptual and non-conceptual, which is then incorporated into the teachings of the Madhyamika school in terms of looking at things and saying it's the middle way. The middle way being that one is seeing things from the idea of um, the uh, just mind. And, and one has a, a straddling of, of apparent reality and absolute reality. And one of the things that I read about bodhisattvas that really, really hit home was that a bodhisattva straddles between apparent reality and absolute reality. And, and it is in this way that there is the middle way. That is the middle way is straddling between them. We don't discount um, the apparent reality, we don't say it exists or doesn't exist. Likewise, with absolute reality, the things in terms of looking at it is that we don't look at reality from the viewpoint of a definition of a uh, life and being. 
And that's why my point was in the mind work forum when I was reading what these philosophers and, and famous thinkers were, were saying, they're all missing it. They're missing things because they kept saying, when you do this, when you do that, and there's no you there. And, and what is, uh, Nagarjuna would have shredded them simply because they are assuming something, I would say presuming something that has not yet been established, which is the you. And they are using that from that viewpoint of the you, but right view is what Chan is all about. In right view, it's just mine. And if we hold on to it and say, oh, I see this is mine, then it says no mine. Or, and when they're talking about consciousness uh, from the uh, Yogacara school, uh, it says no thought. And it gives you nothing to hold on to. Yet, then, um, Hui Ning was talking about that and saying, of course, there's thought. And they're going, wait, wait, I thought you were a proponent of no thought. But again, he straddles between the two. This is not easy for us to understand. When he's talking about no thought, he's talking about not attaching to thought. When we don't attach to thought, then the mind can be free to express itself um, without being um, conditioned on, on anything. It just simply functions, and that is the function of the Buddha mind in the samsaric realm. We don't know that because we, for so many lifetimes, we had the problem of, of hiding this identity of mind. And please don't, I, I, I really um, uh, kind of started something that I, that after, on hindsight, I shouldn't have. It is not that you are a superman or a superwoman. Uh, and it isn't in this way. It is just mind is mind. When we uncover our identity, it has nothing to do with any kind of a life and being or an ego or anything. It is just that there's not self. And this is a very, very interesting thing because if we don't, if we say no self, then again, we can fall into a nihilistic way of looking at things. But functionally, for, for a Buddhist and for someone using the Buddha mind, they nevertheless use, use the consciousness of a sentient being, or we could say that it looks like the sentient being, but they use, let's say, the body of a sentient being to function and to communicate and to harmonize totally understanding that they're in samsara, but also straddling um, absolute reality, knowing that all of that is impermanent. And it nevertheless, because it's impermanent, it is falls into mind. So it's not separate from mind. This is not easy for us to, to understand, but this is where we have to 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 practice where we have to really look into our our studies to see how do we do this how can we kind of straddle between the idea of apparent reality and this and this absolute reality um by neither affirming or confirming either side or throwing them out and the only way we can do that is through this direct realization, direct contemplation. All of that then is what's coming into, into Chan from all of these schools, from all of these different places. They're all coming in in a, such a wonderful way where we see Chan and we see down below where it says, Chan school, Ekiyana, justice mind. It's, it incorporates Buddha nature, incorporates that our original face. Um, it it stands with the Lankavatara, with the Lotus Sutra, with the Heart Sutra, with all the Prajnaparamita Sutras, looking at wisdom 
and realizing this wisdom generates compassion. We understand emptiness, but the emptiness is the all-inclusiveness of, of emptiness to incorporate even that which appears to appear, but is in fact only appearing because of causes and conditions. Those causes and conditions are governed and generated by Pratika Samapada causes and conditions never fail, which is the Buddha mind. So the Buddha mind is, is right there, front and center always. We just have occluded it, obstructed it with so many different notions of things coming up and our emotions in particular. If we didn't have such strong emotions of, of love and hate, um, we could see things clear. It doesn't mean that we become an automaton or like some kind of a robot or an uncaring, quite to the contrary, we care. But when we, when we uh, are using habitual tendencies, quite to the contrary, that is when we're a robot. We, we are controlled by these habitual tendencies and do not make a free choice of wisdom in the present moment. Chan is all about choosing the Buddha in the present moment. All of this comes from all of these wonderful schools and, and pouring into Chan and Chan taking that what, what is of value. And it doesn't have to fight with this school or that school. It just is directed towards the Buddha mind, always directed towards the Buddha mind in everything we do from, from thought to uh to uh, our speech, to our body. All of them are directed towards the Buddha mind. All of them in the present moment, choosing the Buddha mind all the time. That is what the Chan school is. That's what it represents. It brings forth all of these wonderful um, schools and takes the best of it and looks at it. It doesn't, it doesn't have to fight one school to the other because it looks directly into mind. That is the thing is that if you want to fight and discriminate and say I'm right and wrong, it won't work. But if we simply just put our attention on the Buddha mind, then it, it will work. So that completes it. We probably didn't touch on too much of what I was I listed out here. There's there's so much more that's there, but I but at least that gives you an introduction to the roots of Chan. So I went a little over time, not too much. And I'll go ahead and take some questions. Yes, Michael. My, I thought you, no? You didn't yeah, have a question? I, I lost him. Let's see here. Yeah. Can you unmute? I was thrown out so probably by logging in I, I wasn't there. so um, so my question is this um, so on the one hand everything is created by mind on the other hand this uh, person sitting there is thinking that it creates but it doesn't really and then the bodhisattvas are straddling between both and so I wonder how this uh, fits uh, with this notion in the Vimalakurti Sutra that the bodhisattvas are building their Buddha lands uh, through cultivation and through, through uh, cultivating the mind ground. So, but is there is there a creation going on there or isn't there? There's as much of a creation of a bodhisattva creating a Buddhist land or a Buddha land as there is uh, creating a war. Mind is capable of doing both. But if you ask a bodhisattva to choose, which one would he choose? So, so understanding, like you said, between the two of them straddling, moving, moving sentient beings over into a Buddha land, not bad. At least they have a better chance to practice and fulfill the vow of the bodhisattva. It's a good question. You know, very interesting, you know, but it's it's something that that um, 
you know, to to me that that one just comes right to the forefront in terms of a response. Uh, but it shows that you're really thinking about this, which is good because we kind of look at this and we're saying, well, you know, the samsara is a bunch of make made up stuff, but but what about this? You know, isn't that made up too? And say, yeah, it's made up, but it's better than what what uh, someone who whose mind is obstructed can do. I mean, why would we want to do this? You know, so that's our that goes to our fundamental uh, understanding that you choose the Buddha every single moment. You choose the Buddha, and 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 that's so powerful. It's really powerful, and that's what I love about Chan because it pairs it down all of these things, whether it's Tian Tai or Hua Yan, and all these highfalutin understandings, and just goes right directly to it. So good, good question. David, what you got? Oh, Gilbert, thank you. I've been waiting about two years to hear this particular talk. And I want to ask sort of a novice question here. In everything that I have looked at and everything, um, where do I start? You, you've already started. I mean, the one thing is, is that it's like, okay, uh, David, we're we're going to teach you how to play basketball, um, and and tomorrow you're starting for the Los Angeles Lakers, you know, mm -hmm. and and you get thrown really into the deep end. So now you've got to, I, I've been using this term quite a bit, but reverse engineer where you're at, and um, and work your way back towards towards the the beginning stuff because. If you look down, you don't won't realize how high up you are. But just follow your heart. If you follow your heart, you'll find out that that it will work for you. Okay, and you'll find what what to study. Find what you don't understand and look for that. When you read a, everything, when you when you read a book and highlight it and highlight it and highlight it, and then you go back to it and you'll realize what you didn't highlight was what you didn't understand. Okay. Okay. And then that that's where you know what you you study next. Okay. But yeah, you thank you. Just keep at it. Keep doing what you're doing. You know. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Okay. Any other questions? Today should there should be a lot of questions. No, you guys understood this. Yeah, because I'll I'll have you close your books and I'll give you a test. And Robert, the cat got your tongue? Do you, Robert, do you understand now what I mean by the bologna sandwich? I think you have to unmute him. Oh, there he is. Go ahead. Uh, yes and no. Okay, because uh, it 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 still takes. It's, it, it, it boils down to, con, it's it's just looking continuously looking inward, which is the we always discuss about the right view. It's constantly turn the the attention of of the mind inward it is a it's a continuous never ending practice absolutely it's so when we use this picture here we have mind on this side which is the mirror mind and we have that which is perceiving it and we're seeing this in the middle and so the there's the method that's probably mayonnaise and then there's you the meat puppet which is the bologna so you're just sandwiched between the two and so turning the mind's eye inward, then you can clearly see that the reason using baloney is just simply because it, it is non-existent. You know, when we say, oh, that's baloney, what we say is that, that that's not real. You know, that's, that's a lie or whatever. So that's what that means. And so at least you have now the idea every moment turning the mind's eye inward, never think that, that this you is going to be perfected to anything. 
No. So um, you got to tell that parrot he doesn't exist. He can still be on your shoulder, but just tell him he doesn't exist. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? I'm surprised there's no questions. I would think that there would be a few of them. Michael, again, go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I may just add as a comment, um, this, this different schools and uh, which in a sense, uh, John picked on and accommodated them without really trying to, to see or to resolve all the tension. So it always reminds me of what is going on in quantum mechanics uh, when one um, looks at the interpretation it doesn't work. And so the, there's uh, all the interpretations, the different ways of interpreting quantum mechanics have some point which is unique to the interpretation, but which totally doesn't fit with all the others. And up to now, physicists are still looking for the explanation and the interpretation of quantum mechanics, like the theory behind. And uh, Coming from Sean, the answer would be, there is no such thing. And it works. You can cal calculate with it, you can use it, but maybe the interpretation will never be found. So. Yeah. Couple of uh, comments about that. Uh, one of them was from Shifu. He used to say that the practice is like, uh, like peeling an onion and you just keep peeling it and peeling it and the layers become more uh, or more translucent as you get further in. It's not as white, it's clear and clear and clear until you finally get to the middle and there's nothing there. And and so, you know, that's kind of the way that that we should see the practice is, is just kind of working that way. Sometimes he would say that the practice is like walking up a, a fog and shrouded mountain and you don't know how far it is to the top, but you know that you just have to keep walking. Um, and, and you know the direction you're walking. That's the difference is that when you're walking uphill, you know that you're going towards the top, uh, but you don't have an, any idea how far up it, it is. All you, all you do is you're just simply taking one step in front of the other. And essentially it's kind of like a, a fish going the opposite way of the other fish. And, um, and so it, it's, it appears to be a struggle until you finally uh, get to a point where, where you're at the peak and then there's no effort. Um, but you never know when that's going to be, but you never put any attention on it. But each moment, just like uh, we're talking to Robert, is that you choose the Buddha mind. And if you do that, it doesn't matter what you're doing, if you're meditating or if you're, it, it, whatever you're doing, you choose the Buddha mind. And if I'm wrong about this, the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to be a better citizen. You're going to be a better person. People are going to love you because, you know, you're not going to call them names. You're not going to do things, you know, even now, as I look at things, I, um, I'll be you know, ready to text somebody and I'll do something and then I'll just erase it. You know, I'll go, no, that's that's not what I should be saying or not what I should be doing. Um, and then sometimes I don't even pick up the phone to do that, you know, but it, it's all a matter of practice that we, we try to hone our skills in this way. The more we hone our skills, then the more we become clear about what the practice is and that that's what's really important is to understand that okay good nobody else you know let me off easy today oh Ian, go ahead so one of the the things that i'm really taking away from today's presentation is how it's um, beneficial and even necessary to have some sort of historical context for the, the teachings as they have been going through and developing and interacting with one another. 
But I, I remember back when I was like a, a history major and the, the history class that they made all history majors take, the, the teacher, his, his main driving point there was that you can't count on what people write down as history because uh, victors write history and there's always some sort of slant. Like even today, looking at those two opposing um, or maybe not necessarily opposing, but different Chinese schools, um, one of which said that the Lotus Sutra was the, the highest of all sutras and the other um, saying that the Avatamsaka Sutra was the highest of all sutra. So as practitioners who are very interested in understanding the continual development and evolution of Buddhism, how can we arrive at um, like an objective or a more sort of whole understanding about the historical context? I think we, we do that by studying very clearly and, and using multiple sources. Your question is a very, very good one because sometimes when I'm reading something, I will um, Google the person that's the author and I'll go, oh, this guy's a Theravada or this guy's a Christian, you know? Um, uh, and, and so when you understand from the source, then you understand um, a little bit more of what it is, or it may be that the person is a monastic or a lay person or a scholar, but you, you use multiple sources to try to ascertain um, what was happening uh, during that time period and seeing um, what was the, the major themes that were happening. Now, you know, I just scratched the surface with these schools. I didn't do any of them justice, but um, you know, we would still be talking about awakening to the faith of Mahayana. The first thing I talked about, you know, um, if I wanted to do a thorough job and you come back in a year and I'd still be talking about it. And but the thing is, is that what we want to do is we want to get a, get a broad perspective. That's why I gave you this, you know, and maybe you can put it in some way where people can take it. It's not a, an all inclusive template. It just gives you some food for thought and a perspective that you can take a look at and see how these schools fit together. Again, please, you know, if you show it to a philosopher, you know, or, or a historian or even a monastic, they'll go, oh, Gilbert, no, it, that's not what it's about. You have to listen to what, um, what I'm uh, presenting from the heart that, that all of this came into Chan and they they took the the best of it and uh, used it in uh, in a way that was very uh, very successful. You know, historians and philosophers they always want to have some kind of a fight um, uh, uh, with with somebody. We we say uh, like um, a pedo in 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 Spanish. Um, Letty would know what a pedo is, but it's just, it, a pedo means a fart, but a pedo means that a useless argument that somebody has. And, and that's what they like to do is they, they like to, you know, to do that. And, and it isn't necessarily bad, but the idea of I am right, you are wrong type thing makes it very difficult for, for you to see beyond your argument because you have to press your argument. And, and it isn't in that way. So when we look at things and we see it clearly, then we, we understand, we put aside for the moment the argumentative aspect. And some of the scholars are very argumentative. You know, they will, they will jump on somebody else and really be vicious with them. Um, and uh, I don't necessarily think that that's the best way to do that, especially amongst colleagues, you know, uh, others are, are, are different. But as you begin to get different perspectives, then you kind of understand where that goes. And you don't just get different perspectives. You, you, you find what they're um, referring to and you kind of uh, go back up the stream to see what, what that is that they're, they're talking about. Okay, goodbye, Bill. Um, and the thing is, is that I think that that's what's important is, is that you just kind of get as much information. If there's something that you really want to know or something bothers you, look it up. I've, I've done that many times with authors and I've found, you know, where they're coming from is, 
is uh, from a very biased point of view. So the thing of what I think about Chan is, is that we, we kind of like separated ourselves from all of that kind of swamp gas and just simply kind of looked at what, what we could use and say, hmm, this is useful. We can do this. And, and because it isn't in the words, it's in this direct realization. And if the mind can be directed in the proper way, then this realization will come up automatically. You don't have to conjure it up. It will be there automatically. And it will, it will teach you. It will teach you. It's just very amazing, you know, how it happens. But you can do that. And and so when when that comes up like that, you know, um, you you make your own sense of all of that. But that's how you do it is you you really explore and, and investigate, you know, what the source is. And so never take just one single source of anything um, in terms of that. But, yeah, your question is a good one, um, because I think you have to kind of take a look at it and see, you know, um, I, I'm real good at researching things. I'm, I'm very, very fast at doing that and finding the right stuff. And then again, because of causes and conditions, I always seem to be dropping into whatever article or anything that I, I need to, to, to uh, address at that time. And you'll find that that happens to you later on. Uh, it's very, uh, something very amazing that happens with the, with the practice it causes a condition never fail. So little by little it'll come to you. Okay. Any other questions? Um, did I put you guys to sleep today? I, I was expecting a lot of questions from all this because I know it, it went by, I mean, it was moving very, very quickly. Um, but then again, I wanted to kind of, just show you how this all pours into Chan. Uh, and that's the part that's the most important is so that when you can, can see what the Chan school is made of, that helps you a lot instead of having kind of an ignorance and thinking, oh, the Chan school is this discrete school uh, in and of itself. But no, it, it, is, it borrows from, from all these different schools. It's kind of like in, in a martial arts, uh, there's two martial arts. One of them was uh, Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do, and then another one from uh, Brazilian um, uh, Valetudo. And in the Valetudo uh, was, uh, it meant everything is of worth. And the same thing with Jeet Kune Do, the uh, Bruce Lee school, was everything is, is useful. And so... I think that Sean is is that that kind of a school where we find everything is useful. You know, we don't necessarily have to pick apart one school or another school, but we we find the value. I, I find tremendous value in the Abhidharma. I mean, it's it just a, an incredible, incredible schematic of of, uh, of of the mind. I think Michael, you were showing me something like that, weren't you? Um, there was somebody that had had something and they were they were making a, a uh, yeah, uh, some book that he has. And the author was talking about what Abhidharma is and, and their, their uh, depiction of it was right on, you know, where where you're kind of looking at at something that how how mind works, which is what we do, too. So all of that is just all money in the bank. Anytime you study the Dharma, it's money in the bank. And so you little by little, your heart will will uh, tell you where to go. Um, there was a someone in in um, in the last retreat, um, and she was trying to figure out whether she was, you know, where in China she could go and be stationed at. And uh, it's, it's very, very interesting because I, I couldn't see her in China. And I told her, be very careful, you know, uh, where you decide you're going to go. I said, but I think your heart will tell you where to go. And then she 
<laughs> she actually just uh, emailed me today and she's in Nepal. So, so it's very, very strange how, how things work like that. But it's because of the causes and conditions and things that, that can switch you all around in terms of where you're going. And uh, so uh, uh, I'm hoping that we can help her uh, down the road um, she's in a very poor area and teaching English to to the orphans that are there. So, I mean, she went from, you know, being here in this here and going to probably very, very indigenous, very, very impoverished area. So I, I was hoping she can set something up for a, um, uh, what do they, fund me, go fund me thing. And that we can help her out and send her whatever she needs in terms of finances or materials to help the people that are there is very interesting. Um, and then on Saturday, I, I met a monastic that's going to Africa. And, um, and that was a big switch. He was in Singapore. Now he's going to go to Africa. And we go where our hearts take us to. And we do what our hearts tell us to do. We have to listen to our hearts, not not your um, nostalgic heart, but the heart of mind. This is that great compassion that um, that we're always talking about of Guan Yin. It's not this conditional compassion. So when when whatever we do in our lives, you all have your lives. You all have something that you have some kind of of a meaning to. Listen to your heart. See where see where uh, you go. Follow that heart. You no, know, don't live your life and say I should have done this or I should have done that. Find some way to make a difference. It doesn't matter whether it's just picking up a bunch of cans, you know, um, or or you know helping people out wherever they're at. Um, I would hope that you just don't simply just go to the plush beaches and pick up cans. I think they have people that do that for them. You know, um, I think it's better for you to find something a little bit more um, um, helpful. I'm not, and don't say Gilbert is anti picking up pan, cans at the beach. It's just that I think you guys are destined for much better than that in terms of what you can use this life for. Okay. Any last questions or comments? Did you even, did you understand what I was saying today? I'm not getting any feedback from you, so I don't know what, how this went over with you. Nobody wants to say anything. Ah, oh, you guys must have had a hard day today. Uh, people can unmute. So you're all unmuted now, so you can just talk. Yeah, Lou, you showed up, good. <laughs> Okay. And Lewis, you didn't say anything either. Yeah, I just want to uh, say hi. And yeah, after a long while, this is my first time being in your class. Um, uh, I feel much better when I see the English words for all those uh, sutra. So I quickly did all the search. <laughs> so I was be able to follow you. Um, yeah, because I learned Buddhism all in Chinese. Um, yeah, so yeah, it connects. Yeah. Uh, well, well, yeah, that's good. So um, were we able to kind of post that so people can download it? Mm -hmm. I've done that already. Okay, so that's good. So that uh, in the again, chat, you'll find this overview, that PDF, that's the, the, the what we shared. Okay, good. So then that way, whoever has it, you can take the time afterwards and start looking at um, that. I, I really encourage you just to kind of poke around even if you just get on wikipedia and start looking at stuff that's a start you'll, you'll find there's a lot of, of good information that's there and uh, you know you can move up the line from that but it, it's something that's really worth uh, studying so so that you have uh, this uh, well-rounded education as to uh, buddha dharma that's what i want to do you know i'm, I'm mindful of my my limited years here and limited breaths that I have. And I what I want to leave is uh, a good song, a good community of people that are educated, uh, whether they're monastics or they're lay persons, but that they really know Chan 
and they can preserve it. If you know John, you'll want to preserve it. it it's very special. If not, it just will fall by the wayside like Tiantai or Huayan School, just something to, to talk about and compare. But Chan isn't that way. Chan is practice. It's like Samantha Bhadra or Pushan Pusa. It, we have to demonstrate it in our daily life, not just moving our mouth up and down. Okay. So please understand that. Okay. I will take leave of you all. Have a, a good week. I'll come up with something next week to, to uh, do that so that you might have something more exciting to, to, uh, benefit from but i'm i'm all glad to see you all um invite your friends uh to this and they'll go oh my god that was too heavy or that was too boring or whatever why'd you do that i'm sorry just tell them i apologize in advance but um hopefully we'll find people that are like-minded and uh, then we continue on